Before we do anything else, let's get this name straight. Now, this isn't a monarch called Xperia 1 the second. Officially, it's the Xperia 1 Mark II, though the 1 II also has sort of a ring to it. Its looks are typical of a Sony phone. It's tall and narrow, straight edged and angular. It's made from Gorilla Glass 6 with an aluminum frame. The edge of the phone is sharp and bold, and it offers some nice grip. You get full IP68 dust and water protection too, so if you accidentally drop the Xperia 1 in water, you could breathe easy. Sony's top-end flagships are the only ones out there with 4K displays. This one is a 6.5-inch OLED with a cinematic 21 by 9 aspect ratio, and rather than a cutout for the selfie cam, it's housed within a wider top bezel. With a 643 ppi pixel density, you won't find a crisper looking display out there, and you get deep blacks typical of an OLED. The Xperia 1 Mark II is missing one of the hottest features among flagships this year though, a high screen refresh rate. This one is a normal 60Hz panel, but colors can be tuned to be quite accurate. As far as color settings go, there's a special creators mode that can make sure that the videos you watch, even streaming ones, will look as their creators intended without unnecessary color or contrast boosting. And there is support for HDR content from all major sources, but we found something quite odd. Despite the screen's 4K resolution, content from platforms like Netflix and Amazon Prime is capped at 1080p. This may be solved in a future software update. As far as brightness goes, we got 370 nits maximum with the manual slider, and a boost of up to 600 nits when in auto mode. Not the brightest we've ever seen, but not bad. Many phones with OLED screens make use of an under-display fingerprint reader, but Sony is sticking with a side-mounted one here, housed within the power button. It's well-placed and fully functional. Xperia 1 Mark II has another feature that you don't see much of these days in flagships. There's a notification LED up in the corner, to let you know when to check the phone. So how about the speakers? Well, the Xperia has a stereo speaker setup, and both speakers are front-facing and have been increased in size. The top one doubles as an earpiece for calls quality here is quite nice. With the onboard Dolby Atmos feature turned on, we measured very good loudness and lively mids and highs, though not much as far as bass goes. We can keep plenty of music or other media on the device thanks to the 256 gigs of UFS 3.0 storage on board, which is expandable. The Xperia 1 Mark II's interface is pretty much stock Android 10, with some Sony enhancements and proprietary apps here and there. Most of the functions are provided by Google, including the gallery and the video player. However, the Sony Music Player is still here. Other custom apps include the brand new Photography Pro app, which acts as a souped-up manual mode for the camera. It gives you control over an array of camera features, and they promise raw shooting is coming with an update. And the Cinematography Pro app has been upgraded. It gives you in-depth controls over your video recording, and now includes a 25fps mode, a level meter, an intelligent wind filter, and a new 2K HDR slow motion mode at 120fps. Another one of the updated features is the Game Enhancer app. It acts as a hub for all of your games, and provides control over things like screen recording, touch area customization, and notification controls. As a new flagship, it's no surprise that the Xperia 1 Mark II is powered by the latest Snapdragon 865 chipset. As such, it has excellent CPU and GPU performance, and support for 5G network speeds. Benchmark scores are pretty typical for a flagship these days, maybe just a tad behind competitors due to the higher res screen. The phone does tend to heat up during prolonged sessions, and we saw a bit of thermal throttling, but nothing too significant. The Xperia 1 Mark II comes with a 4000 mAh battery, which is not particularly large for the class. There's support for Qi wireless charging, which is convenient, and was missing on the last Xperia 1. The Mark II ships with an 18 watt wired charger in the box, but supports USB power delivery up to 21 watts. With a bundled adapter, we were able to charge the phone from 0 to 46% in half an hour. Charging to 100%, however, was not very competitive, taking almost 2 hours with the provided adapter. There's also a 12 megapixel telephoto with 3x zoom, a 12 megapixel ultra wide cam with autofocus, and a 3D TOF sensor. In daylight, the main camera captures some of the best photos we've seen from a phone. They have vibrant, true-to-life colors, natural-looking fine detail, and well-controlled noise. 
The way this camera renders fine details is a joy to observe at 100% magnification. Dynamic range is also good, though by default, the photos are a bit too contrasty for their own good. The Ultra Wide Cam's images are a close match to the main ones in terms of overall rendition, including colors and dynamic range. It's not quite there when it comes to noise performance, but detail levels are excellent for an ultra wide camera. This ultra wide also has autofocus, and that lets you get close to subjects and still capture sharp images while getting that wide perspective. It isn't meant for macro shots or anything though. Now onto the 20 megapixel telephoto, which outputs 12 megapixel photos, probably because there is some cropping involved when zooming. Oddly, these are a bit soft and hazy with faraway subjects. But in closer range, it produces photos which are nice and sharp. Color reproduction is consistent with the other two cameras, and dynamic range is excellent. 4K video at 60fps isn't supported in the regular camera app, but you can achieve it with the main cam if you switch over to the Cinema Pro app and everything that entails. Still, the quality is great. Now let's move on to the ultra-wide cam which captures well-detailed 4K footage at 30fps, with likeable colors and wide dynamic range. Zoomed 4K clips are visibly soft, though they do maintain pleasing colors and fairly good dynamic range. Stabilization is available in all major modes on all three cameras. It's excellent, with smoothed out walking and panning. And here's a demo of the new Intelligent Wind Filter feature, which works both in the Cinema Pro app and the regular camera app. It makes a dramatic difference in the audio quality of your footage. A high-res OLED screen, front-facing stereo speakers, a flagship-grade chipset, and a powerful camera system. But does the Xperia work? The Galaxy S21 is a flagship phone with flagship features, though Samsung is doing something a bit different this year. With the S21 series, the gap between the vanilla model and the Ultra one is wider than ever before. The plastic back isn't that big of a deal either. While it is kind of a bummer to have on a premium phone, it doesn't feel cheap, and we rather enjoy the phantom violet color and matte finish. Plus, the S21's small size and lightweight make it a nice choice for someone looking for a compact, high-end phone. The way the camera bump curves into the aluminum frame is a nice touch too. It's the S21 series signature look, and is especially striking in this color. And you get full IP68 waterproofing on the S21, as you should expect from a Samsung flagship phone. The S21's dynamic AMOLED display is 6.2 inches, with a small punch hole for the selfie cam, and is protected by Gorilla Glass Victus. It's the same size as last year's, but with a lower 1080p resolution. This year, the refresh rate is adaptive, so it will adjust depending on what's on screen. So this way you get that smooth effect while touching the phone and scrolling. But the phone will save energy when it can, going down to as low as 48Hz. Of course, content looks excellent here. Though it isn't QHD, the resolution still seems plenty sharp. And you get deep blacks and vibrant colors, which are adjustable in settings to be extremely accurate. Brightness is excellent too. We measured a maximum of 415 nits with the slider, and a boost up to 850 nits in bright conditions, regardless of whether adaptive brightness is toggled on or not. The Galaxy S21 also has a pair of stereo speakers for your audio. You get sound from the earpiece, under the top frame, as well as from a bottom-facing speaker. We're hearing very clean and pleasing vocals and nice highs, but not that much in the way of- The final major piece missing from the package is the charging adapter. The S21 supports up to 25 watt charging, but you'd have to buy that separately if you don't have one. With the 25 watt adapter though, we were able to charge the S21 from 0 to 55% charge in half an hour. Not crazy fast, but decent. The phone has a 4000 mAh battery, the same capacity as last year, but it scored much better in our tests, earning an endurance rating of 93 hours. Now onto the S21's interface. It's Samsung's One UI 3.1 based on Android 11. One UI 3 integrates plenty of features from the new version of Android. You get notification history, which you can access in settings. There are also revamped media controls, where you can easily swap between playback on different apps. Now you can pin apps to the top of the sheet that appears when you want to share something, so sharing things to your favorite apps is easier. 
And with One UI 3.1, you no longer get a Samsung Daily home screen panel, but the more useful Google Feed. Under the hood of the Galaxy S21 is a cutting-edge flagship chipset, either an Exynos 2100, like we have on our unit, or a Snapdragon 888, depending on the market. Both are built on a 5 nanometer process, and are supposed to be quite close performance-wise. However, we were only able to test the Exynos, and we weren't exactly blown away by the results. Regardless though, in real-world tasks we had no problems using the S21, and gaming is a breeze, especially with games that support a high frame rate. Plus, you get support for 5G network connectivity too. Let's move on to the Galaxy S21's triple camera setup. On paper, it's pretty much identical to last year's S20. There's a 12 megapixel main camera, a 12 megapixel ultra wide angle cam with fixed focus, and a 64 megapixel telephoto camera that provides 3 times lossless digital zoom. In good light, 12 megapixel shots from the main cam are quite appealing. They have nicely saturated colors, wide dynamic range, well controlled noise, and an adequate level of detail. Comparing the output to last year's S20+, Plus, you'll notice a difference in processing. The S20 models had warmer, more saturated colors, a trend not only for the main camera, but pretty much across the board. You can take 64 megapixel shots with the S21's telephoto camera at a little more than one time zoom. These are very detailed. The dynamic range is as good as from the main cam. Two times zoom, the results are generally good, but a little soft for some reason. Three times zoom adds some upscaling to the mix, which results in less sharpness and contrast, and noise is a bit more visible. These photos are still very usable. According to Samsung, improvements in AI stabilization make taking long zoom shots, like at 30 times, easier and with better results. Maybe it is a bit easier, but don't expect great quality from this level of zoom. We weren't too impressed by the 12 megapixel shots from the ultra wide angle cam. While the dynamic range is commendable, the photos often came out rather soft for some reason. It's more apparent if you compare it to the sharper photos that last year's models could come up with. Hopefully, Samsung addresses this through a software update. In low light, the S21's main camera performs well. The exposure isn't too dark, and you have a wide dynamic range, and good color saturation. The level of detail is pretty good too. Turning on night mode results in better contained highlights and lifted detail in shadows. Low light zooming with the telephoto camera doesn't produce nice results. The photos come out mushy and noisy. Night mode does improve things a lot though. You get better detail for both straight edges and textures, and the noise gets cleaned up. Without night mode, the ultra wide camera's performance at night is nothing impressive. These photos have a dark exposure and are soft and noisy. With night mode on, the image quality is improved a lot, and shadows are brightened considerably. As far as video recording goes, little has changed from last year. We prefer the 4K footage at 30fps from the main camera, rather than 60fps. This is detailed, with pleasing colors and excellent dynamic range. Here's 4K at 60fps for a comparison. 4K zoomed videos from the telephoto cam are good too. At 3x zoom, you'll get a decent level of detail, and while some noise is visible, it's subtle. The 64 megapixel telephoto cam can also be used to shoot video in 8K at 24fps. We're not big fans of it. The footage isn't all that sharp or detailed, and there are some visible compression artifacts as well. Electronic stabilization is available in all modes, including 8K and 4K at 60fps.